Um, so just for the record, the um, uh, council member Vinker, who is the third member of the rail committee was not able to make uh, this meeting. And so uh, Mayor Ku is substituting and we have, so we have full uh, contingency of council members. And this is our first meeting of the year for the rail committee and of this uh, newly constituted group. Um, and so the focus of the meeting today will be on discussion of the 2022 to 2023 work plan. But before doing so, um, do we have on the agenda to um, uh, have public comment for items that are not otherwise agendized? And do we have any speakers who wish to speak to that? It does look like we have a hand raised, um, Bob Leanne. Great. Just one moment. Sorry. No problem. We'll have. Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me? There we are. Go right ahead. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hi, my name is Bob, and I have a public comment. Um, I live right at 101 Alma Street, which is right next to the Caltrain Rail Crossing at Alma and Palo Alto Avenue. And I just wanted to share and spend a few minutes to share about the extremely loud honking and um, horn blasting that really occurs every time the Caltrain crosses the intersection. This happens frequently, um, several times within every given hour, from early in the morning to late towards midnight. The honking noise um, really varies by the train conductor. <clears throat> Sometimes they like to go in short sequential bursts, like burr, burr, burr. Um, oftentimes it's really much longer, burr, burr, um, even after the head of the train has passed the intersection. There are a few conductors who simply honk a few times um, before the train passes in, at the intersection. So as you can imagine, this creates a really unhealthy and disturbing environment to live in. Um, whether it's taking a conference call at home, trying to un unwind or relax, or spend time with family and friends, this continuous honking ultimately affects the mental health and well-being of me and those that live around me. I do understand that the honking is for safety purposes, but I personally feel that there are already enough safety measures in place to know that train is coming. And I believe that trying to create a healthier and peaceful environment to support the wellness of the residents in the area is just as critical. So that's just my short comment. Um, I wanna thank the council and all those that have already been involved in trying to find a solution to this matter. Um, I hope that together we can continue to make downtown Palo Alto and that entire area a beautiful place to live, work and prosper as a community. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And uh, before proceeding to Penny Elson, our next speaker, I just want you to be aware that under the primary item tonight or this afternoon is under our work plan, item F is a discussion or is it about agendizing the, the work on quiet zones, specifically with a first focus on Palo Alto Avenue. So you may be interested in that later. And our next speaker is Penny Elson. Welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so um, I attended Monday night's meeting um, uh, regarding the city's work plan. Um, and I noted that uh, today's uh, document, work plan document, the Rail Committee 2022-23 work plan, which is attachment A, uh, this document points to a number of other documents staff intends to use to inform the grade separation planning process, including the bicycle pedestrian transportation plan. Though no consultant for the BPTP has been selected yet, and um, <clears throat> the, the Monday night meeting uh, put the contract approval in second quarter of uh, 2023. So I, my question is, what are the project timelines for grade separation planning and the BPT, BPTP update? And can ca staff please explain specifically how the project timelines for these two projects will be aligned to enable the BPTP to inform the grade separation process? Uh, 
Um, and I'm just going to go offline. I um, and I hope uh, that question will be asked of staff today, and I hope we can get a response, if not today, at a future meeting. Thanks so very much for hearing my comments. Thank you. And our final speaker is Laura Gronka. Welcome. Hi. Thanks so much for um, having me uh, and doing the great work I do. I really appreciate it. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, we can. Great. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to offer a couple of comments. Um, I've, I live on Churchill between Alma and uh, Emerson, and um, I have really appreciated the pastoral committees um, last, last year. And I wanted to just echo a couple um, of things that I heard. One uh, with regards to the, the quiet zone, I really appreciate you doing the quiet zone study. Um, I think it's um, with Caltrain running at a um, schedule that's um, more packed than they've ever in their entire history. Uh, the train whistle is, is definitely a uh, force to reckon with <laughs> for people living and also um, you know, crossing. And so if it's a full quiet zone, partial quiet zone, I was pretty impressed with the city of San Jose, which did a partial quiet zone during nighttime hours um, around 23 intersections within just a couple of years when a train changed to schedule. So look forward to that. Um, appreciate it. The, um, the other thing that I just wanted to bring up also was with regards to the Churchill crossing um, you know, and looking at um, the partial underpass options, it's pretty clear that it's going to be um, challenging to get a pedestrian underpass uh, in, in the vicinity of Kellogg or Churchill uh, with the partial underpass option. And I just wanted to underscore the importance of pedestrians and, and cyclists uh, at that intersection, both for the neighborhood community feel and for the high school. Um, I, I know there's a lot of discussion around um, the partial around closing Churchill to vehicular traffic, but um, essentially that partial underpass could potentially close Churchill to pedestrian and cyclist traffic, which um, is, is to me significantly more unfortunate because those are the people where you're inconveniencing more when you have to go out of the way because um, it takes significantly longer. So um, to that end, I thought it would be helpful. I know that we're exploring the partial underpass options with the um, closure as a backup is just to kind of put some, just for the cost, money, time going into this partial underpass exploration, just to, a request to, to put in sort of um, some success criteria in a time bound nature of this, such that, um, you know, we can hopefully come to a decision sooner rather than later on, on that crossing. Uh, but again, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. So that concludes our public comments on unagendized items. And so I think we can now move on to the um, verbal updates on from staff on interagency activities. Um, Mr. Kami, or did you wanna kick this off? Uh, yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, and just noting that we do not have anyone present from uh, Caltrain or BTA, so it'll just be uh, city updates today. Um, First update that I'd like to provide is regarding grants. I wanted to inform the rail committee and members of the public that the city submitted a grant for the transit and inner city rail capital program um, with Cal STA or CalSTA on February 10th, um, just a few days, ago, uh, five days ago. <laughs> and we um, submitted for Meadow, Charleston and Churchill. Um, it was a funding request for final design and right of way acquisition phase. Um, at all three of those crossings. Um, second, the uh, regarding the San Francisco Creek Bridge project, um, Caltrain and city staff met site to um, do a review of the site conditions uh, regarding impacts of the recent storm on the embankments, uh, embankments and bridge conditions. And um, staff also has followed up with Caltrain to uh, reiterate that we want them to provide um, alternative plans for rehabilitation and strengthening of the bridge, and um, also to perform a cost-benefit analysis in order to, to determine um, what the best path is. And uh, Caltrain is still viewing that request, and um, we hope we'll follow up soon. Um, regarding the Caltrain corridor study, um, Caltrain has had meetings with uh, different stakeholders uh, groups in January, and they met with the city and county staff group. Um, which is known as the CSCG, and also with the LPMG. Um, and the consultant, Kimley Horn, shared the project objectives and the timeline. And it includes an evaluation of the technical and um, strategy items, and the timeline for that study is approximately one year. 
Um, at the last uh, CSCG meeting, as part of the strategy efforts, the consultant is reviewing case studies of similar projects in the area, um, specifically um, Metrolink, um, Alameda, Alameda um, uh, County East project, uh, Melbourne uh, Level Railroad Crossing, and Long Island Railroad. Um, <clears throat> moving on to a um, project which has correlation to our grade separation projects. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the Embarcadero Road um, bike improvements, which uh, was previously a large CIP project. Um, we've uh, rescoped this project into a much smaller project where we're looking at the Emerson Avenue um, to Alma Street portion of Embarcadero Road. And um, we've uh, been working with city procurement um, to um, get our consultant BKF engineers on board to uh, perform this work. And um, BP, BKF um, engineers are the consultant that had previously prepared the plans um, to um, nearly 100%. And so we um, are, are moving forward with that project and um, we have a consultant on board now to review the plans and are repackaging the bid documents um, and plan to conduct a community outreach meeting. Um, finally, and this came up in the public comments regarding the quiet zone study. Um, as you're aware, staff is working with Menlo Park um, and the consultant, which was hired um, for the Quiet Zone study at Palo Alto Avenue. And they're currently planning to conduct an outreach meeting, um, which is scheduled for March 23rd um, at 6 p.m. at the Ariaga Family Recreation Center, um, Oak Room 701 Laurel Street in Menlo Park. And um, Notices will be sent out to both residents in the vicinity of the crossing and also through all of our uh, social media communications. Yes, that's March 23rd, 2023 at 6 p.m. Well, we'd be happy to follow up with more information about it. And uh, with that, uh, that, that concludes all of my um, comments. Happy to take any questions. Great. Um, so, uh, colleagues, any questions? I, I have a couple of comments and questions, but let you go first. Any? I would like to ask just a clarification. You said you're meeting 6 p.m. Oak Room in where? Uh, it's in the um, Ariaga Family Recreation Center, the Oak Room uh, 701 at Laurel Street. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. That's all. Yep. Um, and I was real glad to hear that things are proceeding on that Embarcadero bike and ped section uh, between um, Alma, Alma and Emerson. Alma and Emerson, approximately. Yes. Um, and you mentioned a community outreach meeting. Uh, where, when would that community outreach occur in this process? Is it? And, and I guess what I'm looking at is, is it going to be at a point? or maybe there need to be two, one where there's an opportunity to have input on perspective designs, and then another to have feedback on whatever is the tentative design that's been, uh, or the design that was developed by the consultant. Yeah, I'm gonna have to turn to Ripon to maybe answer that question, but just to, to give you the high level, this, this project was actually already at essentially 100% design. Um, so really we're kind of past the point of, getting comments on perspective designs um, since we're way past the conceptual phase. This was already a CI. Well, I remember it was part of the design all the way to El Camino. And then yep. what I, I guess, and I'm then a little less clear on what will be the design role of the consultant versus any construction implementation. If we already have that design. I'm going to turn it to Ripon Bhatia, our senior engineer to clarify. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, so in reference to that repackaging, so original project was uh, entirely um, a big uh, project. And so we are trying to repackage it. At the same time, we are reviewing to make sure that uh, the proposed improvements are in line with the current standards and current uh, um, you know, requirements from the highway design manual and other elements that we are, uh, you know, 
required to meet. So as uh, part of that exercise, if there are any revisions or um, changes, uh, we are hoping minor uh, would be made and be able to come up with a community meeting so that we, re because these the plans have been, or the project has been finalized for a long time and people may not be familiar and so be able to familiarize and re, um, uh, you know, uh, fresh the minds of people, especially the ones who are in the fronting, um, you know, and will be affected by that project. Uh, so we just want to make sure that we reach out and uh, to the community and and re um, uh, familiarize them with this. Uh, we would certainly, as uh, uh, you know, have input and feedback. And if there is uh, significant feedback that requires revisions or major changes. Um, we can certainly look into a follow-up, but uh, we are hoping that since these projects were uh, finalized to the extent that they were having 100% feedback uh, incorporated from the community as well as from other commissions and committees, uh, that these projects should be um, ready uh, in a project-ready format. So, so uh, that sounds good. So it sounds like the consultant is really to cross the T's, dot the S, make sure we're in conformance with uh, uh, required standards. Uh, my recollection on this from 2016 is that um, when we had previously had the improvements be on the what we'll call the south southeast side of Embarcadero, instead we said no, it really needs to be on the northwest side. Um, staff at that time came up with solutions that, frankly, I was really I, I, I didn't get a chance to really review the details. And I don't think there was much of a council or committee or public process reviewing it, but I was in awe that they were able to fit it in and make significant improvements work within the physical constraints there. And um, um, and I, I guess I'd like to request just uh, if the committee can be shared a um, what what where we left off on this, because I never saw the details and would love to see them and others may uh, be equally interested. And then, so that's our starting point. And it sounds like we're not expecting make changes at all. Yeah, that's correct. And we'd be happy to um, bring that um, to the committee. Great. And then um, just on the Caltrain and VTA uh, issues, um, uh, as uh, most of you know, I'm now on the Caltrain board and I'm chairing the LPMG group uh, and chairing VTA. So I'm getting an opportunity to um, be in more constant engagement with all those bodies on various issues. One of the big things that we've struggled with is we have this MOU um, that Caltrain has proposed to us, uh, basically to like for Mountain View and Sunnyvale to charge us full costs, their full costs for design review and then subsequently project management. Uh, BTA themselves have been interested in whether they would, what their role would be since through Measure B, VTA is coming up with the, uh, they are the primary funding source. Caltrain had not historically had staff that was really, um, had this capacity and expertise, although they've brought on some really, I think, excellent um, uh, new teams uh, to do this. Um, but we and other uh, cities have had real heartburn over that um, MOU understanding. We created a uh, uh, an ad hoc committee of VTA of the Mountain View, Sunnyvale, and Palo Alto uh, around grade separation issues. Uh, but Caltrain is having to charge the cities because they have no funding to do this themselves. And um, uh, and so us saying to Caltrain, you shouldn't charge us for this, is trying to squeeze water from a rock unless they can, um, uh, they can uh, be provided that funding. And one of the funding sources is that uh, Congresswoman Eshoo had a set aside of $2 million toward the Sunnyvale one grade separation design and the four in Palo Alto. She had additional dollars that were even bigger ones toward uh, some of the construction of in Mount View and elsewhere. Um, but is staff at very familiar with that earmark that Congresswoman Eshoo got through for this purpose? It went to VTA, but it's Caltrain that we want to be have funded to support this. So 
Do you have any insight? Something I intend to be talking with. Um, I've already discussed it with Caltrain staff, and uh, I intend to discuss it with BTA staff, but I just wanted to ask if you have any insights on that earmark, because I hadn't appreciated that had gone through with that designated purpose. It's really exciting that we got that, um, but I, I don't know any specifics on how that can be used to meet our needs. Um, as I recall, at the time uh, that that earmark was being requested, I believe, Philip, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we sent a letter of support for that. And it, it is accurate that I believe the grant recipient was VTA. So given that, I think it's a conversation with VTA as to how best to leverage it. Well, I intend to have that conversation. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, um, let's see. Uh, and then the only other thing is just um, a little update on the LPMG. Um, uh, we have our next meeting coming up. Um, uh, Council Member Lowing is our representative. He was already at the first LPMG meeting of the year, and that was really a carryover uh, with the prior chair. Uh, we, uh, I would say that uh, Caltrain not only now has uh, staff that uh, we've met with multiple times that are their technical team on the whole grade separation. They also have engaged with the consultant group of Kimberly Horn, who has developed a really extensive uh, uh, engagement and outreach plan uh, that um, I am impressed with both their plan and their staff. And, um, and uh, there are a lot of times where, um, you know, consulting outreach is uh, really to kind of check boxes. Uh, this is really substantive and uh, well thought, and I'm very encouraged uh, by what they have uh, designed and how they're proceeding and the capabilities and vision of those staff members. And I, uh, I, I really hope on that process. Um, but the other real thing challenge for Caltrain is um, how do they, like all most of the transit agencies in the region are facing a fiscal cliff where the ridership down and the revenue from, uh, from um, fare box recovery uh, having tanked, um, they're all in trouble on operational funding. Um, and how do they rebuild the ridership in part, as well as looking for um, a government uh, bridge over the next couple of years so that these agencies don't collapse and uh, a, a total collapse of our transit system in the region if they don't have this, um, what they're calling the fiscal bridge um, uh, uh, gap filled. Um, and one of the things that I just wanted to share is that I've come to appreciate it. You know, Palo Alto was the second highest boarding system prior to the pandemic. In the pandemic period, it was actually the highest boardings. And um, that's a high percentage of a low number, but um, it's nevertheless even more than San Francisco, far more than Deardon in, in San Jose at this point in time. Um, and then the question is, how did that happen? And it wasn't just happenstance. We had strong boardings traditionally. But we, in 2011, with the hospital development agreement, we had as a condition of approval uh, uh, go passes, the Caltrain passes for there. Stanford actually expanded it beyond what we requested, which was uh, for all the incremental increase in employees. They ended up deciding it's so good they extended to all employees. Then we've had our TMA, where we under came to understand um, that uh, in the downtown area, uh, the tech companies, big tech companies tended to have their own TDM programs. It was the small, lower income uh, uh, paying uh, service businesses that really needed their employees needed the help. And that's where our TMA is focused on with either providing VTA smart passes or counting go passes. And that expanded uh, that and included into lower income riders and Caltrain is historically not a system that provides lifeline service uh, for low income 
uh, transit users. It's an anomaly uh, nationally in its income level and, and the fact that riders are typically discretionary riders, not necessity. So it's a different ball game than most transit agencies. And then we got pushback from our own TMA to say, well, you're pushing all the businesses to uh, do this. Uh, how about the city walk in the walk? And we provide go passes for all of our city hall area employees. And between those three measures, that's a real model for the cities up and down the corridor to follow. And for that matter, for the major trade groups of so the Silicon mm -hmm. Valley Leadership Group and Sam Cedar and San, uh, San Mateo County. So I say all this because I want to make sure that our staff uh, is hearing and our public that I'm going to be pushing for uh, whether there is an interest in cities up and down the corridor developing similar models to drive that ridership as a benefit. And it frankly, in this era where we have remote work and many companies are trying to induce employees, either pushing or inducing them to uh, have greater number of days at the office, and it also is affecting local economies, all the re remote work, uh, whether this uh, go pass has become a, uh, a real inducement for employees to come back to work especially with the added dimensions of Caltrain of the new downtown subway connection in San Francisco and the um, with the new uh, electrification, faster trains and uh, really modern, comfortable trains with Wi-Fi and comfort, really a business class ride. So I, that's a long way of saying that I think we may want to put together as a package what we've done and uh, and work with our business community on promoting it. And then um, once we've s described that as a model, we can offer it to Caltrain and they can try to propagate it amongst up and down the corridor. And I think it's something that uh, Palo Alto should be proud about because when you really connect these things, that's why we're the biggest sporting in the system. It did fall from the sky. All right, um, long long description, but I think it's these are important developments. And on that note, uh, do we have any? Oh, I guess these are just verbal updates. Um, we we can move on to the action items, and just so the public know, or so action item of the work plan. Um, I think what we can do is have the um, staff presentation, and then hear from members of the public, and then have the council discussion. Does that sound good? Uh, uh, and uh, I'm going to call on Nadia Nayak, who is um, having been the ESCAP chair, is is kind of an ex official member of this committee. Uh, did you have a question on that process? Um, I just had actually a question about the bike improvements on Embarcadero. So, from what I recall, that plan included um, things that were on the north side of Embarcadero and also some improvements that extended to the El Camino intersection. And my understanding, I think, was that those are actually based on. Uh, stuff that relates to Stanford. When Stanford goes over their numbers, we get money to improve intersections. And I thought some of those improvements related to those a long time the ago. The El Camino part. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the question is, I know that that was in the, it was approved by council. It was approved in funding. It got dropped during the COVID sort of budget cuts and now it's come back. Um, and I don't understand the funding piece of this. So I'll stay out of that, but just trying to understand the previous argument for limiting the improvements to only the bicycle part along Embarcadero was because we didn't know at the time what council was going to decide in terms of Churchill improvements. If they chose to close Churchill, they would have had to improve the El Camino intersection. Since that has since been decided, um, or a preferred alternative for having a partial underpass Churchill, the, the question, do you need to come back and look at whether the improvements at Embarcadero, which were already approved by the previous council in 2016, still make sense? Um, and I have... I can send you guys what I found with the two alternatives. I think they had selected alternative two. I'm trying to look that up while I listen to you guys. But um, so just a question on what, well, maybe how we that got could, to that maybe we Maybe that should be something we look at in the context of the work plan too. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, Phil. Yeah, no, not at all. Um, yeah, I think um, I just want to note that I think there were multiple reasons why the, the El Camino portion um, was dropped. But at the time, you know, that, that entire CIP was eliminated. Um, within what we're trying to do right now is we we see a, a small bite-sized chunk that we think that we can tackle easily without trying to go out and, and seek an additional CIP. We actually think it fits within an existing CIP that we have, which is 
bicycle and pedestrian transportation plan implementation. So we were trying to find a creative way to make sure that we got something done there. Uh, you know, I walked over there the other day and I just looked at it and it just, it's something that needs to be done. And we just saw that we recognized it and Rip and I said, how can we get this done? So that's where we are. Uh, uh, music to my ears. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, Philip, would you like to kick off uh, the discussion of the work plan? We have a, now I, a member of the public said that they couldn't find the agenda item on the council website. Um, yeah, I, I actually just clicked through to make sure it is there. It is there under action items. Um, okay, great. There's both the staff report, there's an attachment. And amazingly, our, our <laughs> deputy city clerk, even the um, uh, little, uh, one page presentation thing that I have here. And just noting, I really don't have much to present today. I actually just want to share. Um, this is really <clears throat> kind of an update on the work plan that was approved by city council on August 8th, 2022. And to provide um, context for, um, you know, the planned uh, work item that we have um, based on that uh, work work uh, plan as it was adopted. Um, so I guess actually, um, unless you want me to read off this or, or walk through each one of these, um, happy to just uh, turn it over. I'm or happy to walk through them if if the committee prefers that. Why don't you walk through them uh, at a high level, sure. and then after we hear from the public, uh, we can, as uh, a committee, ask any follow up questions or provide comments. That that sounds great. Um, okay, so I'm just going to dive into this. Um, let me make sure I'm calling it the right thing, so somebody from the public could find it. Under action item one, this is item one presentation, I believe. I'm going to look at the deputy city clerk, make sure I have this. Is that, is that, sorry. Sorry, repeat that. Is it item one presentation? Is that correct? Yes, item okay. one presentation. And that can be found on the city website uh, under this committee, uh, this rail committee meeting. <clears throat> the first item that we have on this list is to review and approve the conceptual plan, plan refinements um, that were based on the discussions of two study sessions that we had um, one was continued um, back in late uh, 2022 um, so what we'd be doing it with that is we'd be bringing back the work that we've done on finding the two un or the the underpass alternatives at the three locations Charleston Meadow and Churchill um, we anticipate that that will um, be ready in either March or April for discussion um, the next item that we have on this list is the results of the geotechnical studies, um, and that would be uh, an opportunity for the rail committee to discuss the implications of the findings of the technical studies on the great separation alternatives, and that would be in August and uh, August or September. Um, next, we have um, to receive the peer. Uh, review of cost estimates for specifically the trench alternative, um, and then also to discuss the implications on the alternatives. Um, that will also be in August and September. And um, currently Ripon is uh, working um, to select a, a peer um, to do that cost estimate, looking at the different um, options that we have for that. Um, the next item is to review the Caltrain service agreement for possible recommendation to city council. And that was discussed a little bit earlier um, by uh, Chair Burt, um, noting that, you know, we're still waiting um, for a response um, from Caltrain, um, but not that they're ignoring us. They're, they're, they're working on it. They're working on revising the agreement so that we can have a discussion soon, um, staff discussion to make sure that it, um, addresses some of the concerns that we had um, that actually I submitted a memo to the rail committee back in December, um, our December meeting on. Um, and we hope that that would occur in May or June of 2023, or at least we would have, um, well, we'll update that as we hear back from Caltrain, but the, you know, it is kind of pen there um, work. Um, the next one is to receive the Caltrain update on the San Francisco Creek bridge. Um, rehab and replacement, which I also mentioned in our staff updates. Um, the item after that is uh, regarding funding and legislative information and opportunities. Um, it's ongoing staff updates. I provided one today. Um, the next one um, was also referenced. That's to receive the um, Caltrain corridor crossing strategy, which they're calling CCS. 
um, and that's their their study, and also the um, uh, issues regarding foot tracking and technical issues. And they've currently targeted um, approximately a year for that study, but uh, we're expecting sometime between November and March um, that we'll uh, re receive that finalized study. Um, the next item is regarding the bicycle and pedestrian transportation plan and um, considerations for uh, the new east and west uh, bike ped crossings um, for possible recommendation to city council. That was actually brought up as well in uh, public comments today. Um, we're expecting that to occur sometime um, in approximately November to March timeframe. And the item after that is um, to review and provide feedback on um, the improvements for the implementation of quiet zones at California Avenue. And that's scheduled for April of 2023. And um, then we've got a rail committee recommendation to city council for the implementation of quiet zones um, to occur uh, following that in August through September of 2023. And then the final item on here, which is maybe the most critical, is a uh, rail committee to um, provide a recommendation to city council for either narrowing or selection of um, alternatives for grade separation. And that date is TBD. And with that, happy to take any questions or comments. Well, I'll just um, say that I want to make sure everybody also sees the attachment, a work plan, which takes what you've put down here as kind of a, a tentative meeting schedule, uh, but the the work plan gives much greater detail on the actual, it's four columns, the focus area, the rail committee activities, the time frame, and a progress report. And um, I found that to be um, really um, extensive uh, and uh, very helpful. Uh, and so I I just wanted, for purpose of our discussion, uh, that probably gives us the greatest understanding of what Philip just summarized on each of these uh, categories. Uh, so, do we want? Uh, do we have any technical questions before hearing from the public and then returning to the committee for discussion? Uh, Chair Bird, if I yes. can, if I can just really quickly, um, thank you for referencing that attachment A. I just want to note that columns A or the the first three columns that you referenced, the focus issues, the planned rail committee activities, and the anticipated timeline, is what was um, uh, approved by City Council. The the last call, the progress update, is what we added um, as information for this uh, specific meeting. Thank you. Uh, I don't see. It. Oh, Nadia. Um, so I had a couple of questions. Um, one is, I know that um, we have potentially the report of the El Palo Alto tree coming forward and kind of where are we on maybe touching base internally on what that means and externally of what we're going to tell Caltrain and kind of how that impacts everything. So just don't, I just want to flag that. Yeah, thank you. We are, we are definitely tracking that. That is uh, very much tied to the San Francisco Creek Bridge issue. Yeah. Um, a second is uh, when you on the tentative work schedule where you have the thing about the BPTP um, bike crossings, how does that line up with any outreach that may or may not be needed for these different things? Um, yeah, particularly I'm thinking about SEAL, right? Yeah. Okay. So yes, the SEAL, well, just in general, the, the first part of the BPTP is to start with the community outreach. Mm -hmm. So just uh, I appreciate you bringing that up because that was a, a comment that we received, um, as you heard from Penny Olson. So I, I, I'm not sure about the quarter two thing and apologies. I'm really back to quarters and I'm not sure if it's a calendar year quarter or fiscal year quarter or what, what the reference is. But um, this week, we're actually planning to let procurement know um, who our selected vendor is. We just completed interviews. Um, and, um, so we're, I'm we're, sorry, that's the vendor on which this is the vendor for the BPTP for the bicycle and for the transportation plan. So, uh, we're working on, um, getting the, um, the negotiation, the finalized scope, um, following that notification this week. Um, and, um, after that, the, um, the contract will get drafted very quickly by the city attorney. Um, so we do expect that project to kick off fairly soon. Um, and so I guess re regarding timeline is, as you 
asked the question about outreach. That's the first portion of the project is to get outreach. Um, also, you know, we've still we've made that request to um, PAUSD to get their dot maps. Um, we still haven't received that, but we um, we hope that we'll get that soon. We did get a commitment from them that we would receive that. We do think that will help. Um, also, I'm not sure if you received. Um, there was a study today um, that uh, are not Bullens sent in um, regarding um, the crossing. I think that was sent to the rest. And can you explain for folks what the dot maps are about? Yeah, the dot maps. Thank you. The dot map that we've asked for PAUSD show where their students are traveling um, from in order to get to um, Pali. So that's why we're hoping to um, get that information. Um, but just to note that in our refinement process, we do have um, a, a version of crossing at Seal and a version of crossing at Kellogg. So we've created that as part of our uh, refinements for the underpass alternatives. Um, was there, is Kellogg still active? I thought, was there action uh, on that? We This committee uh, voted to remove it. But I don't know if that get to the council. I'm trying to remember. The committee voted to uh, not have any further work done on Kellogg, as I recall. Um, uh, good afternoon, Jim. Again, uh, so my understanding is that the committee that was a study session, and the objective was that we don't spend much effort on the Kellogg and look into a seal as an alternative. So. Uh, while we thought, uh, while we were discussing, we mentioned that any uh, concepts that are prepared for uh, uh, for Kellogg will be applicable to the uh, seal as well, uh, because they have the same cross section and the same uh, width and everything. So we were uh, considering that there will be investment and understanding that these can be utilized on the seal if needed. And as part of the refinements, we would bring it as a comparison that will bring more light to the be benefits of either. That's helpful. I, I just want to make sure that the public understands that Kellogg is not actively being pursued and tentatively set aside as an alternative. Yeah. Great. I was just going to make the comment that um, it seems like a really long time for us to be waiting for dot maps. So I don't know if who's on the city school liaison committee, but maybe that can be flagged for whomever those, uh, uh, whoever's the liaison now. Um, Duly noted. I was going to also ask that you're looking at the dot maps because a member of the public brought it up. So where's the communication with the school at this point? Oh, with the district, I'm sorry, Palo Alto Unified. Are they involved in any uh, more involved or are they still sitting back? So actually the DOMS are something that we've been requesting um, on an ongoing basis um, from the school district. That's not um, something that a member of the public brought up. Um, that oh, is okay. something that we've been asking for an active basis. And sometimes we get some of the dot maps um, specifically for the, um, the, the move to um, Greendell. Um, we received dot maps, mm -hmm. um, the, the temporary relocation at uh, Coverly. Um, so, so but we in, in the planning effort for great separations, um, that has been slow in coming. Yes, we've requested it. We um, did hear from the school district that we get it. We have not yet received it. Thank you. We have at least even the latest. Like, what's the most recent version that we have? 2016, 2020. I mean, clearly, 2020 would be a bad reference, but. I'm not aware of any that we have for for Pali um, within my tenure. Uh, the city. So uh, let's at this time, let's go ahead and um, open it up to members of the public who would like to speak on um, our agenda item, which is the 20, 20, 2023 calendar work plan. And First speaker is Penny Elson, uh, to be followed by Laura Granka. Welcome, Penny. It should be your floor. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, follow up further on my questions about how these timelines align. Um, so what I see in this um, 
in in the the document that uh, Philip Cami just showed is that you anticipate starting to integrate BPTP information um, into your planning process sometime in starting in November. Um, but the process, according to the work plan that we saw on Monday night, um, doesn't get approved by council until Q2, quor second quarter, which starts October um, of 2023. Um, that's pretty late. So these timelines, from my perspective, do not align. Um, and I just want to say that the public outreach process takes many months. Um, the, the writing of this plan is a two plus year and approval of this plan is a two plus year process, often two to three years. So I want to understand uh, more fully how, how really that's going to happen. I think we need some detail on that, like what kinds of work in the BPTP planning process need to be prioritized in order to inform the rail committee uh, in a timely way. And, um, yeah, I, and I appreciate, you know, sort of the grand picture here, but I, I, I think um, we're missing the point. I mean, we've, we've, um, it, the South Palo Alto um, bicycle situation during construction period for grade separations and after construction um, is going to be far worse than what exists in North Palo Alto because we have no existing grade separations of any kind, not dedicated for bikes and peds and not for cars either. Um, and I, I, I'm concerned about SEAL also, but I am very, very concerned about what's going to happen for the kids in South Palo Alto who presently are commuting by bicycle to school. Um, and I just want to remind everyone here that every student who rides a bike to school is taking four car trips per day off the road because it's two tr a trip in and out in the morning, a trip in and out in the afternoon. That's four car trips per day. You will have to accommodate all of those additional uh, car trips during the construction period without the necessary road capacity, with less road capacity than we have today. I don't understand how that happens, and I think we need to be planning for it. And I don't, I don't see the alignment of these timelines that enables us to, you know, provide information that enables staff to do that planning in a timely way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and our next speaker is Laura Grunka. Welcome. Hi. Uh, thanks so much. I had two two questions. Um, one, uh, thanks for the great overview, but uh, first one is, what's the criteria by which you'll ex commence and expand the quiet zone study beyond Palo Alto Avenue? Um, again, I just think quiet zones would be a significant improvement to the community overall, given that grade separation seems to be a long way off. And so just wanted to know if, if there was clear criteria by which we'll expand beyond Palo Alto Ave. Um, and then second, um, I was aware that there's some ongoing safety improvement or some other intersections, notably Churchill Avenue, um, and like the, the sidewalk will be kind of expanding um, a little bit. Um, and I was just curious if I didn't see that in the work plan. I didn't know if this was committee or another, but just wanted to make sure some of those improvements were still on the table such that um, in the interim we can improve um, the safety overall. Um, and, then, and then with that one, if there was any opportunity to modify that that design slightly just to keep make it um, improve it a little bit more for pedestrians. I know there was another option that removed one lane of vehicular traffic on Alma from four lanes to three lanes um, going southbound. Uh, but if there was an option to put that back on the table just to leave a little more room for the bikes and peds. But, um, but beyond that, just wanted to make sure that was this was the safety improvement was still on the table. Thanks. Thank you. And that appears to conclude our public comments. And so we can now return to the committee for questions and uh, discussion. And um, we have time to go through this in uh, a thoughtful and detailed way. Uh, this um, committee meeting was scheduled all the way to four. We're rolling along pretty well. Um, and so uh, feel free to um, go through this in um, in good depth. It's going to be important um, for us to really make sure that we've set the year's agenda um, in a way that's going to uh, 
reflect our priorities and our sequencing um, because that ends up being part of the challenge of what needs come first in order for something else to occur. And a lot of these are have a lot of interplay with each other. Um, and so we need to think those things through. And, and um, I just encourage us to have um, uh, good, thoughtful dialogue on this uh, over the next hour or so. So uh, who would like to go first? Uh, Councilmember Lowing. Yeah, I want to just address uh, one of the big picture items first, which is <clears throat> item A on the attachment A, um, but also <clears throat> ties to the last thing on the green sheet <clears throat> of the one page pre presentation. <clears throat> and that is that it says additional studies will take up to a year, depending on start date and other criteria. And then on the tentative schedule for rail commission's recommendation to council, it's TBD um, at the end of the year because it's about a year. So I just want to get kind of a uh, understanding for overall messaging to the public that this is probably another year before we can actually make recommendations to council and council can act on it. But I'm welcome to have you push back on that uh, just for the clarity of where we are in the big picture. And if you want to itemize you know, what are the some of the dependencies that you reference, and I know some of them, but I'd rather just leave it open-ended, let you answer. Well, yeah, and I, I want to, I guess, I, I would agree with that, but I want to also clarify that the rail committee could make a decision that maybe one of the one of any of these many criteria um or one of these items on here is the deciding factor so that's the one thing that i mean like as an example the trench alternative cost estimates that could come back and and still be very high and the rail committee might say let's eliminate the trench from consideration okay. so those are kind of the the there's and and I think Chair Burt described this really well. There's so many dependencies between different things that any one of these list of items could determine whether an alternative continues to be viable or makes it or makes it more viable. Um, so I, I think that's the challenge in kind of predicting when um, this can all complete. But but I do think you know if you know that. I, some of the things might be worth waiting for is, is the. And I, and I went on the trench in particular, I'll, when it gets around, I, I think I've, I've got suggestion on uh, some uh, something on that. So I'll just. So just to break it down into the four intersections, if, for example, the Churchill um, partial bypass, we get whatever the two variables are here that give us all of the data and we understand the fun funding, for example, we could move on that one in. June before we make other recommendations in December or end of year. I'm just kind of testing the uh, the flexibility here. Yeah, well, I, I think Churchill specifically is one that maybe is a little bit easier because it's it's the council's already selected a preferred alternative for that one, and we're really right. finding that one. That's why I picked uh, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that that's a that's a great example. Mayor Koo, <laughs> thank you. Um, so number B on attachment A, um, I was just wondering, is there any way to kind of have pri uh, approximately approximate funding for some of the things that you that we're doing? You know, say for example, if it's a trench, would it be a, would you be able to get a ballpark figure about what a trench would cost, or you know the underpass and so forth? Then at least when we're looking at all of this there's numbers behind it, even with studies, you know, um, when you're doing analysis of things. Yeah. So the, the trench is a, a little bit of a strange example, no, no offense, but because we're, we're doing a, we're trying to seek a revised cost or a peer review of the cost estimate, but we have cost estimates for all of the alternatives so um, currently okay. that exist on our connected Palo Alto website. Okay. And I'll be happy to show you where, but each of each alternative has a fact sheet mm -hmm. that has a cost estimate um uh, associated with it and there's also the matrix thank you which has a comparison of all costs across and actually the um x cap report has all of that has information that. as well okay um and so i was just kind of wondering if that there might be a way that it's more visible just itself um so if that can be done um the other one is um so if i understand correctly caltrain created a c what is that called CSS? 
CCS committee yeah, CCS, uh, in order to review the questions that we asked them for the designs? Not exactly. The CCS is a study. It's a um, it's the study that actually they'd been promising for years that they were going to kick off. And we had been, um, it does answer or can answer some of the questions that we've been asking. So that's contained in it, but it's actually not for us specifically. It's for the entire corridor. And the acronym is? For what? what is it? It's Caltrain Corridor Crossing Strategy. So it's Corridor Crossing Strategy. It's a very confusing. We've got CSS, we've got CCS. Too many TLAs. We don't want any more three-letter acronyms. Now. That's a three-letter acronym. <laughs> <laughs> okay. At least we know that now. Um, so obviously, you know, I mean, with them kicking off this uh, committee to do this study or, yeah, it, the answers are going to be coming back pretty late and we're trying to move ahead. So I think that's an understanding that people need to have is not us continuing on with discussing, discussing, it's actually also a responsibility on their part, not providing some of the answers to us. And if it's a corridor project, you know, up and down, um, we're all dependent on each other um, and need this study to be completed ASAP. Yeah, that, that's one of the reasons why uh, we've been pushing on them so hard for so many years to get this going. And they had staff issues and um, staffing issues, and they managed to get it kicked. But as uh, Chair Burt um, mentioned, it's uh, Kimley Horn that's actually leading this, right? And um, and it's uh, encouraging. You we, know. Uh, we've we've um, had very encouraging meetings with them as well. Staff, um, we think that they've got a, a good process set up to get this project going. Uh, I guess it's a good reminder that it should be thought through first before they initiate a project. You know, and so we're all sitting around waiting and trying to get it going. But okay, thank you. And this is kind of a problem because all of our residents don't understand that. So there, there's an important messaging issue here as we go forward on the year. Absolutely. And, and just further context for that, historically, what Caltrain did is uh, each grade crossing that a city would propose in a corridor over the years and decades, if they needed to have any design differences from the uh, very kind of limited existing technical and design standards, they would have to submit for uh, Caltrain to review that as a one-off and for Caltrain to charge the city for the review of that one-off, whether it is a bridge deck or a thickness or like Mountain View has done or um, uh, a, a different construction method that saves time and money like the jack box construction or the vertical grade or the vertical curve. And with our Palo Alto generally being um, a constricted corridor, meaning narrow and built out on either side, our grade crossings are more challenging than most of the rest of the grade crossings in the corridor. So we've needed, if we wanted to have solutions that uh, either lowered the cost or had fewer impacts on the community, we have a whole series of exceptions that we would be uh, pursuing. But Caldrain has already acknowledged that most of the things that we would call exceptions are things that they will likely be building into new technical standards that would be the norm of what's allowed, and then a narrower set of things that might be exceptions. And I agree with you fully. I, I would really like us to look at having staff com compose maybe a draft of explanation of this for the public. And we as a committee, or I, I would be glad to review it, to have it so that we're communicating these basic concepts uh, in a way that everybody understands. Here's where we are and what we're hinging on and uh, what we need from Caltrain so that we can move forward. Um, okay. Um, well, let me wade into several other specifics. <clears throat> and I felt maybe as I, if I use the tentative schedule <clears throat> as a first reference point, uh, not sure if you can point to me where in the work plan it correlates. So the third item is <clears throat> peer review cost estimates of trench alternatives. Um, 
and their uh, implications. And I guess that that's a subset under the various, um, like A, looking at design alternatives. So on the trench, um, correct me if I get any of this wrong, uh, but we had um, wanted a for, it wasn't uh, a viable option for Churchill, uh, nor Palo Alto Avenue, which we aren't actively pursuing. Uh, and so it was only a possibility for Meadow and Charleston. The uh, One of the key things that we're looking for from Caltrain is they need, um, they are required to uh, have a passing track section of somewhere three to four miles from what we thought was South Mountain View up to North Edge of Palo Alto. Uh, we've recently had a clarification that they had a couple of years ago ruled out far South Mountain View up to Castro. And so it's an narrower distance that is possible. In Palo Alto, not only are we built out next to the corridor, uh, but in North Palo Alto, particularly around Churchill and Pierce Park, it's amongst the narrowest in the entire corridor, 60 something feet. But Caltrain is needing to look at a, a three to four miles of passing tracks. It's pretty clear and they've acknowledged that in that Churchill area and really north of Oregon as a result, it's just not at all likely that they will choose that, that section as part of those three to four miles. They haven't officially ruled it out, but it just seems not possible. And now that they've, we now know that the area uh, that they'd be considering is from Castro, essentially north to Oregon. That means Charleston and, and East Meadow are likely areas that Caltrain will need to reserve the possibility of four track. Our alternatives don't have to be built for four tracks. We just can't preclude a future four track in the design. When we've looked at trenching, that was one option that if you went to four tracks, my recollection is it's really infeasible. Not only in, it drives up the cost enormously, but that would be their problem. But from a fit standpoint and a construction impact, a four track trench, it, it, well, you, you can't build a two track trench and come back and do a four track later either. That's the other problem. And so what I'm leading up to is because we now are recognizing that trench for those reasons, unfortunately, is even less feasible than we had hoped for. We were hoping that maybe the cost could be lower than was projected. Are we really at a point where there's no point in pursuing further um, uh, the trench alternative for those reasons? And do we need to get to a decision point on that? so that we don't spend more time and money pursuing something that many of us were interested in when it was a two track possibility, but it just can't work for four tracks. So that's a question I have. First, Philip, do you have any feedback on that? And then uh, including, if we hear from colleagues that that is kind of makes sense, how would we proceed to, as a committee, do we need to get this back to the council uh, as an early, as we, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to wade through all this and have all these recommendations to council at once. Do we break off certain things that can help us accelerate our process because we're facing up to certain realities that have now emerged? Okay, I'll do my best to respond to that. Um, first, I just want to note that I think Caltrain is actually the ones requiring the passing tracks because it's no longer required by high speed rail. Technically, but Caltrain needs it because of high speed rail. So high speed yes. rail wants to say it's not us, yeah. but uh, they can't offer Caltrain can't operate <laughs> their future train service level if high speed rail is here unless That's they right. have the passing it's, tracks. It's also for their yeah for their their. Um, enhanced uh, service. Vision. That's right. So you yeah. combine their future service model with their required to allow for high-speed rail to someday be on the corridor and you put to the two together and they have no choice but the passing tracks. Yep. Uh, okay. But uh, coming back to your question, thanks. And that does, I think, merit some 
conversation or some explanation to the public that might be confused by it. Um, but um, I, I do think that there's um, now, of course, one thing that we don't have yet is we don't have confirmation from Caltrain that they will require this four track. We are assuming that they possibly might, um, but we don't have clarification. You mean them. that at that location? At the location. That's correct. They, they, um, they have clarified that they will need it in that that zone, right? That's right. And that that does kind of um, come back to something that um, that um, member Ku had mentioned earlier regarding regarding um, whether we need to wait for Caltrain to finish this, because Caltrain did offer to provide us answers to some of our questions in an expedited fashion if we were to essentially pay them to do that work ahead of time. So just mentioning that. Um, but to answer your broader question, yes, I think there's value if we think um, or if the committee believes that the trench is no longer viable at any point in this time to remove that from consideration, because then we can spend more time focused on the alternatives that we do think have um, more merit or more likelihood of success. So sh short answer um, to to the, the question, but I, I think there is value in that if, if we've decided that we think that that is um, the direction that Caltrain is going to head. So do we have that data is the question. Which data? The, the data to make the decision that we should pull. No. Through. So what Philip was really saying is, and this goes, I think it was our last meeting of the year uh, where Caltrain came forward and basically said, we have this proposed MOU. And if you will pay us, we, we will answer these questions. Now, as I said earlier, they don't have funding to do it for free. Unfortunately, we need to get them the funding. So they don't have to charge us. Um, but within that discussion, I said, okay, I understand certain things are technical and design standards. And um, and we have one question of our concerns over being charged for that. But this four-track system is not an issue of um of where we stand on um on asking for a standard. This is a Caltrain decision. And we also asked and have not received from Mountain View or otherwise, uh, how did Mountain View extract the clarification or the decision uh, from Caltrain to not include from Castro to the southern edge of Mountain View? And have we gotten any response on that? Uh, just to note that they, they sent a letter requesting it, but according to Caltrain, there was not a response to that. Um, so, all right, I, I will think, follow up on that. Yeah, myself. But uh, you know, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. I was just going to mention that. Um, oh, give me a second. It'll come back to me. Sorry, no, it's it's got it right. Um, so um, the I will um, I will pursue with uh, Caltrain. Uh, that the answer to that now the letter that Mountain View sent did we get a copy of that? Yes. Has the has the uh, committee seen it? Uh, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure. We'll 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 check and follow up on that. Okay, good. If we could see that, uh, in fact, if I could get it shortly, so that if I'm going to pursue this directly with Caltrain, uh, I can have that reference point. Sounds good. I'm sorry, okay. I remembered what I was thinking is. Our pushback to Caltrain is exactly as you described. That um, that really we were not asking them for like a design exemption or something where we needed something for our design. This was a decision that Caltrain needs to make about where the four tracking needs to occur. This is a business decision for their operation, and therefore something that they should be helping us by telling us, not something that we should be paying for them to tell us. Exactly. Thank you. All right. Um... <clears throat> And then I had a question on your fourth item, which was review of the Caltrain service agreement. Uh, well, I'll just first, uh, sorry, before we leave the previous one on the trench. So we had that tentatively scheduled for August, September. Um, um, I will, um, I, I think we, we don't wanna be held up on, we can't really do any of these other discussions around Charleston East Meadow, uh, well, we, we could do things, but removing something that's infeasible from the options will help accelerate our decision-making. And so I, I think we really wanna resolve this 
uh, four track issue, especially as it relates to the trench option as soon as possible. And then we can perhaps move forward on, on some, uh, just dropping that from the list, frankly. Yeah, th thank you, I'll concur with Trent. <laughs> yeah, and I say that as somebody who had hoped we could consider a trench. If I may, I'm just looking at Google Maps, and if you take the very kludgy tool that Google Maps has to measure from Castro Street just to um, Meadow, it's exactly three miles. So, I mean, by sheer logic, if if the Castro decision is approved, then there's no way that they're not going to turn around and tell us that we can't, that we 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 don't have to certainly plan for you know to not preclude four tracks. Yeah, not preclude. Yeah. But if we remove the trench quicker than what this thing says, then we would be saving ourselves the review of the trench cost estimate. Um, and in addition, I mean, there's geotechnical studies, which we need anyway for the underpass. I don't think we really save anything there, but it does help move that forward. Um, I did just want to flag for you, and I'm sorry to sort of jump ahead the rest of your comments, but I, I've been hearing from folks that are following the, the feedback that payback has been giving on the alternatives. And it troubles me that because the viaduct eliminated from the alternatives at the time, um, they're only giving feedback on the three remaining alternatives, which would make sense. It would be, it's the trench, the hybrid, and the underpass. Um, however, um, if you solely put on your bike helmet, haha, for a second, and only thought about bikes, um, you, you kind of have two ways of thinking about bike crossings. It, either the ideal form of bike crossings, if you have to cross Alma, of which the obvious answer is flat is best, which makes the viaduct the best option for the bike community. And if you have to look at something where you are going to um, skip Alma from a biking perspective and not have to have them um, interface with cars, then you would improve the underpass in some way. So I just want to say that if there's a consideration of removing the trench, I do think it makes sense to discuss the viaduct, not just for the bike community's perspective, but also because it takes much less construction time. And one of the things that we've never put a value on is how much shorter of a construction period. And I believe it's like two, I think it's two years less than the hybrid. Even though there's a cost difference, there's a price to that. And that all ties into something which is actually on, on uh, attachment A, letter A. The very first bullet is review grade separation selection criteria for any revisions. We haven't looked at that criteria since 2017. And now would probably be a good time to think about, okay, what are we actually optimizing for? Because ultimately the cost estimates we get from the consultants are just for the stuff that they're building, but doesn't account for all the disruption that we're going to have. And so I just want to say that I, I think if I, I'm trying, I, don't, I, I recognize that the idea is to pare down the alternatives and not keep adding stuff back on the table, but I would be remiss if we didn't highlight that and think about if you really are going to remove the trench if payback is going through the trouble of giving comments, do they also give comments on the viaduct alternative? Because that makes the most sense from a bike perspective. So just want to throw that out there. Well, thanks. And so that let's, let me try to fold that into um, a couple of uh, comments here. So one is if we are at a point where the trench isn't viable because we're going to have to allow for four tracks in that area, um, are we otherwise in the process of having uh, additional work on the peer review cost, the trench alternatives? Should we, that, is anything actively going on in that? Um, we've just received bids on that, um, noting it's, it's a sub consultant that would be through our AACOM, but we actually um, requested that we can review the bids and select which uh, vendor would do, provide that peer estimate. So all we're doing right now is uh, reviewing the bids for that. We have not, I don't, unless Ripon tells me otherwise, and we asked ask for additional clarification on, on some of the tasks, but we have not selected a vendor yet. So that has not started. So should we get guidance as a committee on uh, a recommendation that we hold off on those expenses? Uh, until we uh, hopefully can get an answer on the four track and make a determination of whether we don't want to expend those dollars and at that time. 
apologies. The reason I'm glancing at Ripon is I'm trying to think back to what the council direction was regarding this. I know that they approved the contract. I don't know that they directed us specifically. Did they direct us to do this? Okay. So the council did direct us to do this. So that, that's the only right. catch that I have, but I'm not sure yeah. that there's harm in us holding on that. We can hold it and it could be something that we add to the early uh, 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 recommendations of the committee to the council for any any adjustments that we'd want to do early this year so that we're on a best path. Okay. So why don't we why don't we start composing a tentative list of things that may we may want to um, uh, take to the council uh, for concurrence with committee recommendations. And that would be one. Um, I'd like to yes. add something. If um, since we're talking about the trench and the possibility of putting it on the side and not working on it, I think that the outreach to South Palo Alto needs to happen. Um, you know, they they are actually looking. There are quite a large number of them that are looking at a trench, uh, and are quite vocal about a trench um, because right now the underpass is not very. Um, clear about what it's going to look like, especially with the U-turn and the circle and um, potential of house housing being um, taken away. Um, so I think that it's going to require quite a lot of communication and clarity for people in South Palo Alto. Um, so I, I do have the concern of us here talking about potential elimination. Um, so I want to put that out point we it may be starting to become clear to us but we've got to make sure that we share the reasons for that with the community okay um related then to the big this a of refining our alternatives um we have the fourth well we have several different items are related to this, um, but we have the the Caltrain service agreement, which affects how we get answers from Caltrain on some of these things that today would be technical or design exceptions, but um, but going forward uh, may be standards, and we could either proceed and pay them to, um, because if, if we want answers before they've gone through this process over the next year or so of um, uh, their new technical standards, we'd have to pay them to do this one-off. And maybe this goes back to this earlier question about uh, Congresswoman Eshoo's earmarks, uh, because the description of that earmark sure looks like it could cover our cost to go forward with um, uh, uh, Caltrain uh, pursuing our needs as exceptions, even as we, if we wish they would instead have already gotten to the point where they had new standards. And maybe that's a solution um, to how we move forward without us, it costing us as a city a bunch of money is that we can tap into that funding source um, to move forward on that. And it so that involves discussion with VTA on their understanding of the uses of those dollars and with Caltrain on where they really stand on the timeline on, on the um, um, uh, new standards. And I think we have that in there, the timeline that Kimberly Horn has given us and I think, as I recall, we're looking at a good year before we get answers. And we don't want to wait that long, in part because waiting means we lose even more opportunities to tap in to one-time massive federal funding uh, from the Infrastructure Act uh, that are going to be, I say one time, but they're spread over, we think, about a five-year period. And the first year has already passed. Mountain View was able to tap into that. Uh, we want to make sure in the subsequent years we're far enough along that we can also tap into those funds. Council Member Gray. Construction. Yes. You might also, um, part of the challenge has been that the only work we've done is on two track alternatives. We've never done any four track alternative work. 
you might want to let it be known to uh, Representative Eshoo's office that we are unable to use the money that she has secured for us because we're not getting an answer from Caltrain about the location of the four tracks. That might actually help speed things up because if they come back and say, okay, definitely you have to allow for four tracks, then we can go and ask our things as a design exception because we already have designs to discuss. We have the two track alternatives that we know should not necessarily impede with those. If, if that's some. necessary, I, I wouldn't hesitate to do that. Uh, I'm somewhat optimistic that given that I now have a greater engagement with Caltrain uh, as a board member, that we can uh, shake this tree. And hopefully fruit will fall. <laughs> and not a branch on our heads. <laughs> um, okay. Um, and I'm just uh, sorry, looking at my notes. Um, Nadia brought up this issue of um, that it's been several years since we reviewed the selection criteria. And what we've really done is we've had a de facto evolution in the criteria that we talk about without going back and redefining the criteria and having the criteria reflect what we really recognize or maybe a shift in some of the criteria. And so if it seems that really the, the decision making should be based on criteria and uh, it, it implies to me that maybe in our next March meeting as a starting point, we should have a review of the criteria and update them to reflect our current best understandings. Uh, and that is based in uh, a significant degree on, on not only what we as a committee have done, but uh, what the XCAP had done and input from the community. That's all caused us to have a refined understanding of what criteria should we really be using uh, and certain circumstances have changed. Um, so colleagues, what do you think about um, that issue of uh, putting a criteria review on the March meeting? Uh, and I think that makes great sense. Um, <clears throat> anything that's, whatever that is, six years old. Uh, Not to mention you and Vicki yeah. haven't really gone through them. I do, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Sound good? Sounds really stumble. All right, got a thing done. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, jumping down to, and I'm, I'm, I apologize for going out of sequence here, but... Um, uh, on the quiet zones, and we we've got down here under your plans in April and then August uh, first the committee review and council recommendation on that. Um, but that's specifically on Palo Alto Avenue. Members of the public have asked about uh, the other grade crossings because you know we could have many years before we construct all three of these other grade crossings. Um, Philip, any thoughts on um, inclusion of quiet zones in the other locations? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm gonna have to let Rip and maybe expand on whatever I say here, but uh, I, I do think that what we can do is we can take Palo Alto, we've got a consultant and there's some uh, economy of scale and having a combination of the work that they're doing in Menlo Park and for us in Palo Alto. So. Um, I think the Palo Alto Avenue um, can be used as an example of, as something that then we can apply to the other crossings. Um, I'm not sure um, what work would be necessary for that. So I'm going to turn it to Rip and to see what that is. But that's our thought is that we would use that um, as an example to apply to the other crossings. Yeah, thank you, Philip. Uh, yeah, to add to that is that we do plan on having an RFP out by end of this year so we can have a consultant on board to do the three other crossings. Uh, and and have it on our plan. Uh, that sounds great. Uh, and so that everybody understands the one at Palo Alto Avenue we're working with Menlo Park on right. and sharing resources. Um, and so if we can uh, have that reflected in the work plan, uh, that it's, it's not just Palo Alto Avenue, but that may be, uh, that's the impetus uh, for the others. Um, that would help people understand that we're, we're looking at all of them. Um, yes. If I may, um, can you give us an idea of what step 
right now is taking place with the Palo Alto Avenue quite zone. Where are they at? Yeah, currently we are in the outreach phase of the original study. So we have developed a conceptual plan with uh, uh, meeting with the CPUC and Caltrain. So adhering to the standards of the FRA to develop a, um, a, a alternative that would be likely acceptable to um, CPUC and FRA for approval of the quiet zone. And so we are seeing feedback from our community as a first step um, and Seek, uh, it, which is on March 23rd, uh, and we'll bring back also to the rail committee that same information uh, we were hoping in April, uh, and have, uh, that will be another opportunity for the public to provide an input at, as well as uh, the rail committee to get that information. Um, we were hoping that we would also uh, communicate with other committees that we have in the city to that will also give a platform for our community to provide feedback to the for and for the conceptual plans. So once the feedback and outreach is complete we would finalize the plan based on the rail committee's uh, input and direction as well and um, we could make a recommendation uh, so the finalized concept plan would be recommended to the city council uh, of this study and uh, for implementation of this uh, quiet zone so the implementation of the quiet zone includes it starts from a geo88 application from CPUC, which is an approval from CPUC and construction and having an agreement with Caltrain and CPUC to construct those improvements and then request. Once the comp improvements are complete, then we will request for a quiet zone to be in installed by FRA. That looks like in September or end of the year. Uh, well, so it would be in front of council for um, recommendation um, to implement between, um, I think we said August to September. Great, thank you. Um, so in terms of the outreach that you mentioned or engagement, is that going to be Menlo Park that is going to be doing it or are you, is Palo Alto also doing an outreach to the community for the conceptual plans? <laughs> So as a community outreach, the first community outreach meeting that we are planning is in collaboration with City of Menlo Park. That's why it is in the Menlo Park. And Menlo Park has four other intersections, which are much more complicated. And we are all doing it as a community meeting. But we will be meeting virtually with our stakeholders, different stakeholders, and providing opportunity. And also at the rail committee uh, for our constituents and stakeholders to provide feedback. We will be notifying the residents within the vicinity of the Palo Alto Crossing for that community meeting. Uh, uh, for the March 23rd. Well, that was part of my next question. We've had a number of speakers. We we know 101 Alma and others there. So they, uh, presumably they have some sort of a, I don't know if it's a condo or it's a condo group. And so we could go through that organization to do an outreach and not limited to those residents, but. Um, yeah, so, so we'll be noticing all the nearby um, uh, houses and businesses and all of that. Um, in addition, we'll be doing uh, social media and all of our um, regular uh, communication channels. Sure. For but the in addition to kind of the standard noticing, if we just meet with the leadership of that association, I think they will uh, help promote this uh, uh, within their group. So we developed a list of all the residents, uh, which include all the apartments within that. Uh, uh, there are 700 about, uh, and we are sending ma mailers to them for this meeting. Yeah, but I'm saying specifically, our, our 101 Alma is the, the most severely impacted, and they have an organized group, um, uh, and and engaging and letting them really help us yeah, we'll, we'll be make, uh, we will make sure that they're included Good. in this outreach Good. and then um because we're now saying the quiet zones are also uh something that the evaluation of the palo alto avenue one will potentially lead right into churchill it's metal in charleston um i i think we want to um have the outreach uh, for this march 27th meeting in menlo park including um, of folks who may be interested on those other three speed crossings and get the word out to them. Uh, because now that we're saying, hey, this is going to be the ability to move right from 
Palo Alto Avenue into these others, um, they're going to be interested. So we would have a separate outreach once we start the process for those other crossings, which would be in the other RFP. Of course, anybody be welcome to go to those. Anywhere. Yeah, I'm just saying we want to get the word out about that meeting to everybody who's interested in quiet zones, because this is the foundational yep. meeting on it. Yes, we are include, planning on including it on the city calendar to make sure that the whole city is aware of it. Okay, so beyond yeah, the, the city camp, calendar, the social media, social media, all of our normal communications channels. Nadia, I think we had an email list also for anyone who's following uh, the XCAP process. You might want to blast that list as well. Yeah, they will certainly be included. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, then I wanted to next wade into the issue of the bike and ped crossings. Um, and just to frame it for everybody, we we came to recognize uh, the last year or more uh, that sequentially, if we're going to go and do this massive construction project, just so that everybody kind of recalibrates that we, the estimate is that these grade crossings will be the largest, most disruptive and most expensive infrastructure projects in Palo Alto ever. Uh, so other than that, just a piece of cake. Um, and um, But we realized that we, in, in, particularly in Palo Alto, with our safe routes to school and our whole kind of leading uh, bike mode share, that when we go to construct the vehicular, new vehicular grade crossings, that today are also bike and ped crossings, as limited as they are for safety in those regards, um, that we would disrupt the ability of kids to go to and from school um, by bike in our 50% approximately of our kids who are doing that, uh, many of them crossing at the grade crossings. Uh, and therefore, we've been looking at moving forward with dedicated bike and ped crossings uh, ahead of the vehicular ones. And that we also last year had explained to us from uh, multiple agencies of Caltrain, VTA, Senator Becker's staff that said there is a lot of funding available uh, for um, active transportation, meaning bike and ped uh, uh, construction like this. And that we wouldn't necessarily have to even tap into our Measure B dollars, perhaps, uh, for even construction dollars, so that we need to do it first, that we have potential other funding once we get to the point where we've identified um, the locations and preliminary designs. And then even after that, those discussions, we've had uh, really additional funding sources opening up at the federal and state level. Um, and so uh, the discussion we had last year was how do we reconcile that with uh, we don't yet have our new bike and ped master plan? And that's why staff has framed it as they had on, on some choices that we have of uh, how do we either go forward in parallel with the new bike and ped master plan, um, which I think would be ideal that we, uh, we, we don't wait another year or two. Uh, to get the bike and ped master plan uh, to begin this process and hold up the whole sequencing of our grade crossings um, and and make ourselves less eligible for funding that may evaporate by the time we or be reduced by the time we would otherwise uh, be pursuing it if we waited after the bike and ped master plan was uh, developed. One point I had made previously is that um, in regards to the a grade crossing in the vicinity of Loma Verde, um, the council back a couple of years, three or four years ago, had referred that consideration to um, the NVCAP process. And the NVCAP process really didn't move forward on that. And so it wasn't coupled as part of the X cap and, and the uh, grade crossing processes. Second, <clears> that our existing bike and bed master plan going back how many years? I'm not sure. Uh, pardon me? Uh, 2012. 2012. Uh, it, it 
and maybe even the previous one, had uh, identified um, the intention to have a, uh, a, a crossing in the vicinity of Loma Verde all the way back then. So it's not like it's a new concept. It just hadn't been acted on. Um, and then we, so, so we've got that, that one, which as um, Penny Elton had, had correctly noted, south of California, uh, Oregon and California Avenue, we have no vehicular uh, grade separations and no bike and ped grade crossings. North of Oregon, we have the Cal Ave bike and ped underpass, as antiquated as it is. And we have Embarcadero uh, for bike and ped, 100 year old and not adequate, but it's the, it's something. We have the Homer undercrossing. And then as bad as it is, we have a university. So there, uh, we have four north of Oregon and none south of Oregon, which in my mind, in addition to this sequencing issue, it's also a priority for the community. Uh, we have... Um, I don't know, I, 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 the Safe Roots School Committee could let us know how many hundreds, if not thousands of kids are crossing at grade um, today. It's it's us, uh, not to mention other people in the community who bike and ped. And then we've just adopted, uh, or we haven't adopted, I should correct myself, uh, referred to a future council meeting as a work plan priority, the safe systems uh, or you could think uh, also called safe streets, which are to really look at, at integrated safe systems for cars, bikes, and pedestrians. And I would say that great at-grade crossings uh, are um, certainly high on that list of areas that we are risks to safety and yet more complicated and more expensive to solve than many of the other solutions that we have. That's all a big wind up to saying um, that uh, I would like to encourage us to um, uh, look at how do we move forward on basically the decision to uh, pursue bike and ped grade separations in South Palo Alto um, sooner rather than later. So let me let me pause there. Uh, first, asking Philip if you have any feedback and then my colleagues um, on that, that concept. Okay. Um, actually, I have quite a bit of feedback. I almost think this could be a whole meeting where we just discuss this. Um, but just, yeah, and, and sorry, just to dive in really quickly. I want to first state that when we plan construction of whichever alternative we select at the Charleston, Meadow, Churchill, all of these, we would tend to include mitigations for bicycles and pedestrians to get through, even if on a temporary basis. Um, Rippon actually, in his prior life, has constructed a temporary vehicular access. So not a compet, but a temporary vehicular access that was built, a bridge that was built to go over a bridge that was getting built. So just to, to note that we would make sure that bicycle and pedestrian access is not removed when we're in construction. Um, we would make sure that we maintain bicycle and pedestrian access. So I just want to put that up there. Then a secondary issue that I want to note in all of this is relating to um, what uh, member Lowing had mentioned earlier, which is there's a lot of dependencies. One such dependency for starting um, uh, additional crossing is figuring out whether the rail is going up or the rail is going down, because we don't know if we're looking at a tunnel. We don't look, know if we're looking at an overcrossing. We don't know really what we're looking at until we know that. So I just want to note that as, as one of the... Can I pause? Because I realized, one, I didn't mention one thing, and second on that. So the crossing in the vicinity of Loma Verde would be outside of either elevating or depressing tracks. Uh, pardon me? I think he said it may not be. It kind of depends on the alternative selected. If, yeah, if there was a viaduct even or trench uh, or a hybrid, um, it's outside of that zone. 
Um, and then I didn't, the other thing that I neglected to mention is uh, that on this list, so in the vicinity of Loma Verde, it is in the southern part of Palo Alto, but it's the, the northern one third of that southern part. So we haven't been able to, and this ties into what you're saying, Philip, is that uh, south of there, however we deal with pit bikes and peds, gets tied in with the design for the vehicular separation. The alternatives we're looking at right now is the bike and beds are integrated with that. But there are uh, concerns that the community and the, uh, uh, the bike advisory committee has had with how well that addresses those needs. And But I don't think we can really um, separate that decision from narrowing our decisions on um, on the vehicular design. It could mean that we would have a dedicated um, uh, bike and ped crossing, uh, I'll, I'll say south or in the, in the vicinity of East Meadow or south there, or it could be that, that we come up with solutions that are the best alternative that integrate it. So that one, we, we, we can't really separate it. I think Loma Verde, we could separate it and move forward on a more accelerated basis. Conceivably, we could do so also in a seal and separate that, but I put that as a lower priority than the one at Loma Verde. And so my pitch is that we we look at what we can peel off and get going on and perhaps get funding and construction on uh, soonest that will alleviate some of the stresses from what we would then do later. Sorry for that interruption. That's quite right. I think Ripon's trying to pull up the hybrid, which it looks like might be right up against Loma Verde. Um, so j just want to note that. Um, but uh, uh, regardless of that, stepping back, uh, what we've set up and what council has directed us to do is to use the bicycle and pedestrian transportation plan to um, look at the possibility for new east-west crossings. Um, we do believe that public engagement is necessary, even for Loma Verde, because our understanding is that there was negative, severe negative reaction from some members of the public to that crossing. Um, we also want to look at our bicycle and pedestrian network as a whole. We want to look at it holistically. We want to make sure that we're not just building a crossing that doesn't connect anything. And so that that is one of the keys in, in our bicycle and pedestrian transportation plan is to look at the entire entirety of the city and how the bicycle network connects. So that is one of the first parts of our work that we'll be doing in the bicycle and pedestrian transportation plan is doing community outreach to make sure that we are hearing um, how our community wants to see our uh, bicycle and pedestrian network function. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I fully answered your question. Um, yeah. I would just say that, you know, we, we had looked at an east-west need in that same vicinity back in 2015 or so when we looked at whether we could have a dedicated off-road bike route uh, in the Matadera Creek uh, uh, Valley water right away. So it was really identified and considerable work pursued on something that we found that we couldn't fit it in there, but that's already established in a whole bunch of work and a whole bunch of recognition that what we'll call an east-west route there is severely lacking. I don't think that's an open issue. And then we've had this discussion within multiple years of the NVCAP that said, we need to have that bike route go through there and hopefully ultimately have a better connection all the way to, to what we'll call the north-south route of Bull Park. So we have these these parallel paths of, of essentially Hanover and Bull Park on, and then a, a Park Boulevard on the west side, we'll call it, of Caltrain. We have Bryant and even Cowper and uh, Byron and Lewis all running parallel on the other side. What this community has lacked for a long while is routes that are perpendicular to that. And this vicinity of Loma Verde, and I'm not convinced... Uh, the staff had subsequently looked at, well, should we have a uh, a bike uh, boulevard or a bike uh, uh, path on Loma Verde? I, I 
personally don't think the best solution is to put the cars and the bikes on the same street. But that's why I keep saying in the vicinity. But I think this is well established as that being a really significant gap in our bike system. Uh, so I appreciate that uh, we don't want to look at these things in isolation, but I, I don't think it's an open question as to whether that's a need. I think that has been established for better part of a decade with uh, several different initiatives that were supposed to proceed on that very uh, zone or that area to come up with a solution. The exact path is another question, but I think that's very well established in our community and we've made efforts and we haven't gone forward. That's different from, geez, you've got to decide whether we have a need there. I don't think that's an open question. If I could add one more comment, I think um, I thought uh, Mr. Cammy was going to go there, but since he didn't, I will. It's the issue of perhaps sequencing and how best to accomplish the work. Um, you know, again, focusing specifically around uh, uh, additional bike crossing uh, in the South Palo Alto area. For better or for worse, what we have done in the uh, the Churchill area has been to look at the bike crossing as an element of the bike transportation plan and uh, more physically look at the, the options related to the, uh, uh, the, the crossing itself at, at Churchill. Uh, I suspect that, well, the, the issue uh, both here and going forward on South Palo Alto will be Philip and Rippon and perhaps one other person are the entire team that are working on the uh, on these efforts. And so uh, it may come down to one, the bandwidth to do the work uh, and recognizing that whether it's best to organize it as a part of the grade separation work or as a part of the bike transportation planning work, but either way uh, to figure out how it fits with the what have already been identified as critical path elements of, of both. Um, so I, I just want to raise uh, for uh, awareness this issue of uh, the capacity and uh, question of how it would actually be tackled. Well, that's a, a good point. So if we're, if we're in a situation where um, we have a, an apparent need to sequence this, and we have a rare op set of opportunities for very significant capital dollars, but we lack internal capacity, then I think we need to put that on the table and the council needs to understand what it would take to be able to break that log jam. And what I wanna make sure is that we don't just not do it because current capacity can't do it. You say, it's a problem. Here's what it would take to solve it. Council could decide, no, we're not going to do that. Or they could say, yes, we want to support it. And even in the context of, um, of the um, upcoming budget, if that's something that needs to be prioritized in this uh, May budget, which I know staff is already working on, then we've got to, if, 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 we as a committee want to say, we recommend to council that this be prioritized. Staff has to hear that soon enough that they can fold that into the budget, at least as an alternative, if not a recommendation. Uh, yeah, thank you. And and thank you very much, city manager, for helping me to keep track of my thoughts there. Um, the, the resources is a, a major constraint as we move forward. Um, so I really want to recognize that, but also want to note that we recognize that this is a, a strained resource. And so we actually are planning to include a request um, in the in budget um, for um, someone to work on this. Um, we um, just want to quickly note that I think Mountain View has like five staff working on grade separations um, and that they have what, two crossings. So <laughs> so we, we're, we're, we're doing a lot with a little here. Um, so we, we will be requesting um, additional resources to help us out with this. Um, we think that we're going to have a lot of work done already from the BPTP, um, the uh, community outreach. And we think we'll be in a good position to apply for funding um, for additional um, crossings um, in that next uh, time frame. That sounds great. And can you, so within the Measure B dollars, plus the, we've tapped into other um, 
uh, bike and ped dollars um, uh, and even other uh, measure B dollars that were not grade separation dollars to date. Um, and just so everybody understands that, we in measure B, we not only negotiated what is now over $400 million for Palo Alto's four grade separations, uh, it was 300 and 350 initially, and it's now 420 or a year ago, 420 had grown to. Uh, but um, uh, we had other negotiations uh, for uh, other buckets of dollars in there. And uh, San Jose and others at that time in 2016 wanted to dedicate that to street and road repair because their pavement condition index, their road conditions were terrible. We had invested for eight, 10 years in that and we're highest in the region. And I was able to negotiate that we would have latitude on that our share of that bucket, and we've tapped into it. So from a standpoint of funding our staffing needs, it, are those funds potentially available not just for consultant work and design work, but for our own internal costs? If we needed to staff up, can we tap into any of those funds uh, for our purposes? That is something we'll need to look into further. Um, I'm not sure that it covers staff time. Um, so that's something we will look into that. Um, but also noting that um, if we added additional staffing um, for this, it wouldn't just be this uh, for this alone. It would be for um, other things. Uh, you know, a key example of that was an item that was requested um, by council member Tanaka for a, a bike and scooter share. That's another project which we don't have currently resources to work on. Right. Although that's an example, something that... Uh, we've had an interest in, but it was not something that was endorsed in the council motion. So as of right now, for this year, it's not a tentative priority, even something that's coming back. I think it is a future one, um, but uh, that is an example, but it's an example of a differentiation that council has already made. It's, it's, it wasn't even referred to come back. So it's off table for this year. Um, okay, so this is, we're all, it's hard to unravel this Gordian knot of how these things all intersect with one another and how that influences sequencing and, um, and all of this. But for me, um, we, what I would want to propose is that we, um, that we look at how we bring forward to this committee sooner rather than later, um, a recommendation to the council on sequencing of uh, bike and ped um, crossings, uh, uh, separated bike and ped crossings with uh, the prospect of the one in the vicinity of Loma Verde being the most uh, unconstrained and highest priority. So unconstrained in that it's not dependent on what decisions we make on the vehicular crossing at Meadow or Charleston. Um, it's a higher priority. We believed in SEAL. We have this, uh, and we haven't talked about it, but we have an upgrade at, uh, at Churchill on the existing at grade crossing uh, that is supposed to get start construction already in this this year is that correct on the just the whole Churchill improvements on bike thoroughfare there oh yes uh, sorry um you're asking about the Churchill Avenue enhanced bikeways project yes um, and, and sorry your question was well that's already uh that's already moving forward it's moving forward yes. and so um even though that doesn't answer the question of what our ultimate grid separated crossing would be there it is a significant improvement that is already in the CIP, right? So that's why for multiple reasons, the one in the vicinity of Loma Verde is the one we could move on and seek these big construction dollars as soon as we've got a design alternative. I'm pretty convinced that we could get funding for that and get that done and have real progress on that first leg that helped us then move forward on the vehicular crossings and everything else and is less it just doesn't have the obstacles that all the others 
presently have. That's why I'm pushing it first. Um, and, uh, and then hopefully we will soon refine the metal and Charleston alternatives so that we would then know whether we're dealing with a dedicated crossing or an integrated crossing for bison peds. We don't know that yet. Um, and that's why I keep saying, that, okay, we, how can we have real tap in, tapping into construction dollars and, and do a construction sooner rather than later that will have real impacts on the community? And I think that, that's the one that stands out. It needs to come first and uh, probably needs to come first. And it, it's discreet. Uh, it's not dependent on some other item on a critical path. Uh, and that's, that's why I keep pushing this. And it has a well-developed history of established that we, we need an east-west route in that approximate location. Now we we haven't decided on the location. That would be part of of uh, the the decision making. Once we say we want to prioritize that and refine, we'd have to figure out okay where do we put it exactly, uh, and that's not simple. But um, but that is focused and something we can accomplish and something that I'm convinced we could get funding for lickety split. My pitch. Okay. Uh, that was a lot on that, but sounds like you got yeah, your checkbook yeah, ready. Yeah, uh, I got somebody else's checkbook um, in mind. It's not yours. Don't worry. Um, okay, uh, that was a lot on that, but you know, it's it's what do we move on first, and what are, what are our sequences, and all these things are tied together. Um, so let's see. We've gone through a lot of this now uh, on the tentative plan. Um, as Philip mentioned, the San Francisco uh, Creek Bridge replacement, we're pushing Caltrain to uh, come back to us on um, uh, the option of repair rather than replacement for the bridge. Um, I've raised issues with them on what they've allowed of the de degradation of that bridge uh, over a multiple decade period. Um, so I've sent them photographs of rust, massive rust. I have to quickly note that I think that our in-person meeting with them was due to those photographs. Oh, good. <laughs> good. They're not copyrighted. Um, okay. Um, and then, um, so then we've got, uh, we have this item, uh, updates on funding and legislative information uh, and opportunities for gray separations. So let's just touch on that a little bit. Uh, my understanding is that really to, to have, we have certain funding to help us with uh, furthering the uh, selection uh, and design, preliminary design, which are the prerequisites to tap into the big dollars. Um, is that correct that we, can you, can you tell us what to, let's break that item, which is the uh, sixth one on your tentative schedule, um, break it down between um, maybe three parts to that question. Maybe that's what we do even when we talk about the agenda. One is the, um, the funding for um, uh, uh, to proceed on the selection of preferred alternative and then the uh, preliminary design, which are the two steps that are needed to qualify us for the construction dollars. Um, and then the third part of that uh, is, um, well, then the construction dollar funding pursuit, where that might be. And lastly, legislative aspects, which are different from funding pursuing funding from existing buckets. So um, can you speak a little bit to um, where we stand on available dollars um, uh, for proceeding on design alternatives and then dollars um, for preliminary design, the things that need to be teed up to qualify for the big construction dollars? Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so let me try my best here, and Ripon might have to jump in, but 
So we have measure B grade separation dollars, which we've received um, permission from VTA to utilize, or I guess really not permission is not the right word, but they're, uh, yeah, really their, their agreement with us that we can use that funding to pursue our additional studies um, that we believe are um, part of this, I guess, as you would call it, conceptual design days. Um, in order to help us complete our selection. So we've got that funding. As you referenced earlier, we also have the Measure B local streets and roads because our um, pavement condition index is high enough that we can use that funding for congestion relieving activities. So that's a question I'll have to come back to about the staffing. Um, 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 really what this issue was, or this item is intended to encapsulate is a whole bunch of unknowns, um, but I'll just list some of them. They're grant funds that we're applying for on an ongoing basis. Um, we've applied for MEGA, which is a uh, grant program, a federal grant program, INFRA, which is also a federal grant program. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the update today, um, we've applied for INFRA, um, or wait, I'm sorry, inf I'm sorry, uh, TIRCP. Sorry, I said in for already. Um, just uh, five days ago, that application was new. Um, so th that's the the primary thing here. But this is kind of a catch all for anything else that might come up in relation to any other funding opportunities that arise. Um, another one. Uh, what is it? The Section One Thirty funds, One One Ninety funds. That the, the um, FRA One Ninety funds. Um, uh, so any of those other funding sources that may come into play, um, you referenced earlier preliminary design, uh, the P, uh, that, that phase actually, um, it could be that we apply for funding only for that phase or for uh, multiple phases, even through construction. But some of what we believe will make us more competitive is getting to a selected alternative for all of our um, locations. Uh, right now, we're prior we need to prioritize, or often when we apply for these grants, we need to prioritize. And it, um, I believe, makes us less competitive if we don't have a selected alternative. And, and you said for all of them, but really, you know, uh, we're not likely to get construction dollars at once for, for, that would cover all three. Uh, and so maybe I'd, I'd suggest that uh, getting to one of them with a preferred alternative and, and preliminary design moves us up in the queue for that one, whichever that may be. And so that goes back to just like with bike and ped one, we need to tee, tee up uh, our, our first in sequence, which hopefully is also our highest priority. Um, uh, so that we be, we get eligible uh, for we get in line as soon as possible, um, and uh, and I don't know uh, which that'll be. It's tied in with these other issues, but but uh, we'll have to see what emerges. I'm I'm trying to think back in my memory, but I believe that council had prioritized Charleston, Med, Meadow Charleston, in, in that order. So that's um, following that. That's how we are applying currently. I'm, thank you for that clarification, and I fully agree with with doing uh, prioritizing that. Um, and the, where we stand right now is we're probably further uh, along at narrowing our alternatives for Churchill, but our higher priority is Charleston East Meadow, and that's where I was referring to trying to align our priorities with our sequencing. Um, so that that really further reiterates to us as a group, um, how do we have the focus on on that? Just like earlier in this conversation, we said, well, part of this is, can we remove the reconsideration of uh, of the trench if we just don't have an option due to needing to have a four track placeholder? And should we? bring back and let council decide whether they want to reevaluate a viaduct, not all of South Palo Alto, but just for those two crossings. And I don't know the answer to that. Uh, Nadia, do you have something? I, I was just going to point out, um, the, well, first, exactly what you were saying is that our priority, the council's direction was Meadow Charles, but we seem to be moving faster on Churchill. But I do want to recognize, I, I had spoken to Ripon before the meeting about the fact that the plan, this plan doesn't at all talk about 
when do we start looking at alternatives for Palo Alto Avenue? And I recognize that this is just a year, year and a half out, and that is probably more of a delayed conversation. But I do worry about, you know, we're pushing back on Calvin that the replacement of the San Francisco Creek Bridge should be a rehabilitation and not a full replacement. Um, and I recognize that you are now on the board of Caltrain, so that hopefully provides us a little bit of more illumination into what's happening on the inside of Caltrain. But there's always the chance that because it's a safety issue, that they decide, hey, that bridge needs to be replaced. We've decided it needs to be replaced. If Palo Alto wants to spend money to argue with us, fine. But otherwise, we're going to change it. And what that does is that it puts our options for Palo Alto Avenue in jeopardy. So I wanted to highlight the fact that I understand and appreciate that we have a big staffing challenge and that Port Ripon and Philip are juggling more things than the Cirque du Soleil people at this point. But um, <laughs> we've, we, we really should not drop the ball on what happens around Palo Alto Avenue. And, um, you know, this is part of the Gordian knot that relates to Stanford, because, of course, they own the station area. And so while you think about your response about the community plan that Stanford has and, you know, what's going on with the now deceased GUP, but whatever the new iteration of that is, we kind of have to have that conversation in tandem. And so I know that there's been some consideration of having an ad hoc committee for Stanford. I want to make sure that this is part of that conversation because you may be forced to deal with Palo Alto Avenue ahead of all of them. And then we're going to be caught completely flat-footed. So let me touch on that. So first we have an ad hoc committee um, and, um, and that I think maybe what we should add to our list is a kind of placeholder, lower priority or sequence, but around the three parts of this, uh, the the Creek Bridge replacement, Palo Alto Avenue and intermodal station. Big projects, uh, uh, hopefully not as immediate as the others, um, but a reason to um, even include them within this year's work plan, lower priority than these more pressing issues, includes um, at the the role of the intermodal station and how outdated it is. And that it's not only the highest boardings in the Caltrain system at the moment, but as of a number of years ago, uh, it, it had this shocking number of 900 buses uh, that were loaded per day there. Just, uh, it's a quiz test to ask anybody to take a guess and we'll all lowball it by two thirds at best. Um, and connected with that is a question of in the 2000 Measure A um, for uh, VTA funding was a lot of money dedicated toward Dumbarton rail crossing and secondarily toward, and this is the one that uh, is often forgotten, the Palo Alto Intermodal Center. Those dollars both got transferred to BART, um, which was a big part of why we negotiated so hard on Measure B to make sure that can happen again. And that's been largely successful. Nevertheless, this has been recognized for decades as a major um, uh, critical part of Cal transportation and Caltrain, and the VTA had had funding. And there's a question of whether there are still Measure A dollars that have been undetermined in their their allocation that we could tap into, or other funding sources. I mean, we've looked at MTC and and VTA has talked about helping us there. And now, more recently, in the Caltrain discussion, at our last uh, board meeting. We had a uh, action item on the negotiation guiding principles for Caltrain negotiating with the Joint Power Authority for what's been called the DTX uh, a terminal to date. They're renaming it. Hopefully, not an acronym. Uh, huh? The it's portal. Called portal. The portal. Uh, but the downtown uh, intermodal station, um, and. Uh, that's racing forward because it potentially has massive federal dollars uh, in funding and huge political support um, from very uh, powerful federal and state officials with an interest in that. Caltrain uh, board, at, at my recommendation, modified the guiding principles to place that uh, 
our our position as Caltrain on that issue uh, to put it uh, our negotiation in context with Caltrain's 2040 master plan, which we specifically discussed uh, that that is not more important than grade separations nor other um, uh, uh, station improvements, which Caltrain was focusing on the Deardon station and Redwood City. And I reminded the board of uh, the history of the Palo Alto Intermodal Station and its massive current use compared to the others. I, we do anticipate that Deardon and Redwood City will have very significant growth and greater growth than Palo Alto station. But Palo Alto station right now is uh, far and away uh, a greater user. So that all goes into what Nadia was talking about of we, we need to make sure that we are bearing in mind uh, both that that's on our future list and that having preliminary uh, involvement with it may tee up funding uh, that we need to be discussing with these agencies now, even if we aren't ready to move on this as a project because we have so much else on our plate. So um, how that all fits in, uh, we don't know. Uh, but I think it's important that it not be off our list, that we recognize it's not uh, our most immediate priority, uh, but it is there and of high importance. And we don't want to uh, let huge funding opportunities go by the wayside um, uh, uh, because we, we we aren't even looking at them. Uh, thank you. Uh, just really quickly to explain kind of our, our internal priority and let us know if, if we're thinking about this incorrectly, but our internal strategy was to get one of the other um, locations under into the next phase so that Ripon has the capacity to take on Palto Avenue. But certainly your, your point is well taken about adding it to the list and maybe it's like a, you know, um, uh, I guess placeholder strategizing. Know. Yeah. And we, yeah, I think maybe that's the way we're really talking about is let's get on the list for strategizing as opposed to a bunch of staff resources or otherwise. And, and I agree with you that I think we're all in agreement that we're not talking about throwing it into the, the, the same sequence or priority as the other things, but uh, keeping our eye on the future ball. I just wanted to flag for you, Council Member Burt, the same way Rippon and Philip are doing a great job of kind of looking for grant opportunities that come up. There's a team of Rippon and Philip equivalents on the Caltrain side who's basically taking every opportunity that they can to get replacement money. And that bridge qualifies under the state of good repair stuff because it's really old. Um, and just because of the political situation, that may pop up potentially really unexpectedly, and they may make an aggressive move because it's high on their list. And so it, I, I mean, not that you're not already aware, but it's complicated because the alternative, one of the alternatives to Palo Alto Avenue is relates not just to the bridge, but if you have something elevated, that also goes into Menlo Park, which crosses county lines, which now crosses funding lines because San Mateo County is on a different funding program. They don't have Measure B. They're not as in, as well positioned as some of the other San Mateo cities move on some of those things. And so it, it I, I'm worried that we're going to be in a position, and there's nothing we could really do other than babysit it, but we could be in a position where they end up replacing that bridge and we don't have a say in it. And then we are still stuck about talking about either moving that bridge over or whatnot. The only thing that saves us in, in being able to have a real impact on that is the conversation about the El Palo Alto tree. And if we can prove that we can't mess with the existing bridge and we have to move it over, then that fosters conversation. But also, of That's course, right. that was brings, your earlier point on yeah. why... We want to have that El Palo Alto tree report come forward because it strengthens our hand. Yeah, we, we've uh, been really, really closely working with the people working on that report. Um, so, so, and, and Caltrain is aware that we are um, working on that and that they're they're awaiting that from us. So we are closely monitoring that. I also want to mention you're absolutely right about the state of good repair money. Um, and we think that's what they will use. But I also want to point out that the word repair is in the title of that funding. So that's we're kind of hoping that that doesn't have to mean replace. So just noting that. Very, very good. Uh, Can I just ask, uh, what's the legality of hang, our hanging onto that tree and them saying, eh, it's in the way, too bad? 
I, th- I think that's a really, really um, messy um, proposition because it's a national uh, historic, um, uh, what is it? Yeah, I don't remember the title, but it's a story. Resource, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, number two in the state, I believe. So it's uh, it would be very difficult for them. So I think they are going to need to consider that. Although um, that is one of the things that we may want to look at in that context is whether it has the adequate designation to strengthen our what we believe should be the position. Uh, it on one list of California historic landmarks, it's listed as number two, but. I had assumed it had other greater designations, and I'm not an expert on this, uh, but this is something that we may want to pursue uh, as well. And that could be part of that strategic approach. Um, so anyway, uh, all this, um, I think that's my long list of um, uh, questions and, and input on this. Um, and so does anybody, uh, Vice or Mayor Coop? Oh, just quickly, um, in in that same uh, category of receive updates on funding and legislative information, what kind of legislative information are you expecting or have we had? Yeah, I'm not sure if we're expecting any. I just want to kind of put a catch all in case there is something Mm -hmm. that uh, comes out. It's most likely to relate to funding. Okay. And then in regards to funding, um, so you're working with a lot of grants and so forth and Measure B and potentially if you find the bucket of measure A money. Um, but is there any reason to be lobbying in um, when we go to our NLC, the National League of Cities, um, to lobby for funding over there? I, I guess I'm not exactly sure about the National League of Cities. I, maybe I'm not sure if City Manager Shikata can, has a thought about that. But. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, Actually, um, uh, the same, really. I, I don't know that there's a direct connection, be, given that the funding is typically run through a program uh, and that the NLC would necessarily be the, the route through which that information would pass. Well, in the past, I still remember that we would visit all the uh, legislators, the Congress folks, as well as go to some of the departments like the OT, um, uh, whichever ones that potentially we can sit down and talk to about needing the dollars for our great separation. Gotcha. Gotcha. Which is separate from NLC. Maybe the NLC is uh, is the reason you're in town, but but those meetings really being separate. Yeah, and that's a differentiation between legislative a- advocacy uh, versus uh, uh, through um, agencies that already basically have through legislation, this um, really unprecedented funding that we're talking about. So we can talk more on that, but from the, with the agencies, that is potentially the case to at least make sure they know where we are in our process and, and understand how high uh, our grade separations are on, on the, um, the safety hazard uh, ranking, uh, which is very important as well as uh, this broader issue that is along with Caltrain and we discuss this and our state legislators are starting to really argue it this way, uh, but it's been a Caltrain discussion of the Caltrain corridor and the need to grade separate it. Um, it, Why is that such a high priority? When we look at the state budget and the incredible surplus that we've had the last two years, those have been predominantly driven by the economic engine that is served by the Caltrain line. The entire state budget and frankly, uh, a a real impact on the federal, uh, the US economy resides in this corridor. And uh, in discussion with some of our legislators, it was kind of a a argument that, um, well, they, they really owe it to us to fund these things because this corridor is feeding those the state budget. Um, my argument was, I don't think that's going to be compelling to legislators in Sacramento. What's more compelling is they want to feed the, the vitality of this region in their own self-interest because it is providing those dollars for things that they care about elsewhere in the state. And it is in their, in their interest to support our needs as opposed to the moral obligation to do so. 
And uh, so I think that that's an argument that we will want to carry forward at the state and federal level, and frankly, regionally with MTC, is that it's in their interest to prioritize this, not that they owe it to us, even though they do. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Um, to seem like a long conversation, I apologize for dominating it so much, but I, I, with the, the, with uh, some of the new members and otherwise, um, there's a lot of context. Um, and um, let me just turn to uh, Philip or Ed and colleagues, uh, any thoughts on wrap up? Uh, what, have we answered the questions well enough on kind of helping refine the year's agenda? I'm sure you now need to kind of come back and uh, refine what you had already put down here. Um, and as, as chair, I can, you know, uh, sit down with you on that aspect, but any other things that we should cover? Actually, I, I wanted to add, I don't see Jack boxing in here. Is that still something that we should be um, looking into? Yeah. So that's folded in where with this, um, the technical standards, uh, and that's a construction method part of technical standards. Um, yeah, it's uh, and that that's I would add equally important to that under construction methods is, for instance, uh, bridge decks where refining like Mountain View did in the thickness of a bridge deck, we found out that um, that uh, you know like we had a proposal uh, when we were looking at the Churchill intersection and that. Uh, uh, AECOM had, or, or maybe it wasn't them, but in Mountain View, they had had a refinement on the Rangstorf that if something similar were applied to Churchill, it opens up and means we don't have a center pillar. The whole design gets better. Uh, so there are a couple of construction method elements that are uh, not necessarily design standards. Uh, they kind of intersect. Um, so it would fit under the um, receive Caltrain corridor CCS study within that framework? Uh, yes, some of it, some of it would, but just also noting that Caltrain did commit to us that they would um, be willing to come and provide information about alternative construction techniques. So that is something that we plan to hold them to as well. Okay. Very good. And it also fits in the fourth row uh, of the tentative schedule, which is the service agreement. Would we have them uh, review what we want as kind of one-offs uh, versus what you were describing under the one on this uh, corridor crossing strategy? And then a third sounds like it might be outside either of those that they had volunteered to come forward. So kind I think of three buckets, they are all related to how do we get uh, a refinement in what they will let us do that allows us to construct these things with that are better designs and or at lower cost or uh, uh, lower impacts on the community from construction time frame, all those things. So those are that's the bucket uh, and several different paths that we can take to getting to that end point. Can we have them come? It'd be really great to get a, a Caltrain given presentation on jack box construction prior to you guys as a council deciding whether or not you want to keep the trench or put on a viaduct or talk about the hybrid i mean it would if they've got information that they could give us it would be interesting to sort of hear them and in some ways let them sell their services if you well want. maybe that <laughs> begs uh, on next uh, upcoming agendas what would we like vta or caltrain uh, well caltrain or perhaps vta i should say in that order um, to present on. And we know that when we get them here to present, we get their attention. They move more on our priorities than if we're trading emails or even sidebar meetings. Um, so uh, any thoughts on what we should be looking for Caltrain to come back and report out and or, or provide presentations on in the next one or two meetings? 
Yeah, well, I think some of that does tie to that fourth item that you had referenced, the, the standard agreement. Um, but the one thing that Caltrain had um, committed to doing was talk about alternative construction methods. I think that's something that they could talk about outside of either the study or the um, service agreement. I think that they were willing to talk about that. And so I do think that's something that maybe we can, as long as the dates work, we can get them to come to one of our uh, upcoming meetings. Well, since we're trying to hold our feet and their feet to the fire, um, why don't we see whether even the mark meeting uh, we could piecemeal that, and and you know all the better if we don't ask them to do too many things in a single meeting. We have them in a series of meetings on different subtopics. They had very specifically said that they gave a presentation to the city of Mountain View about jacked box construction. So hopefully, this isn't something that you know this is something they can just repeat, not new material. Sounds good. Ed. Uh, yeah, I just want to comment that um, understanding the priorities for the four <clears throat> and that um, Churchill is not one of the priorities. It is one of the projects. So we basically have four projects. I'm sorry. Uh, so do you, you mean Churchill or Palo Alto Avenue is not? No, I meant that uh, Churchill is not as high a priority as. Uh, right. Memphis. It's a priority, just yeah. not quite as high. Yeah, they're, they're all priorities. This is just, I mean, you were talking about staging and phasing. <clears throat> um, if we're lucky enough to get the answers that says, hey, this uh, the proposal that we're checking out right now, if the uh, partial underpass works, then I think we should do it, you know, move forward on it. Because we don't want to, as much as I love priorities, uh, we don't say, well, yeah, but it's not our highest priority. So let's wait till we get the, you know, trenching figured out uh, further down the tracks, because that would give us... Um, action, which talks to people about funding us uh, and shows shows us that we're active and also shows the citizens that we're active. But based on data, when we finally got the data, we could make a decision and now we're going to go for it. So um, I don't. I hope that doesn't sound like I'm talking about both sides of my mouth, mouth. I'm just saying if we get the data on Churchill and it's, you know, we can go ahead with this, then I think we should do that, even though we'd rather go first on uh, Meadow. Well, I think that that raises the valid question and why I, I was really... Uh, repeatedly talking about prioritization independent of sequencing. And I don't think that that's something we would want to decide at this point in time, but there may be a crunch point at which that becomes a decision. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't at this point in time support that sort of decision just because Churchill appears to be further along in its alternative selection. Totally agree. Yeah. Okay, great. I also wanted to clarify, it's technically three projects because Meadow and Charleston are considered one project together and they have to be done together, which actually qualifies us as a mega project, which has a different funding category than necessarily a regular grade separation and kind of makes us special in the world of funding, if I understand. Yeah, that's that's correct. And just knowing that we actually consider it a mega project anyways, because we're talking about three grade separations, which we've been applying for right Okay. Um, and anything else from staff uh, as wrap up? Uh, yeah, well, I, yes, I just want to say I've got two items that I see um, for the next meeting, um, which is the rail committee to review selection criteria um, at the March meeting. And we'll see if we can get Caltrain if it works at the March meeting um, to talk about um, alternative construction techniques and specifically backboxing. Um, but I just want to kind of confirm the rest of the list of items. Um, and uh, I'm not sure, actually, I'm going to look a little bit at the our, our attorney here to find out, do we need some sort of action um, for the list of items? It's really, I think this is an agendizing sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, it's up to the chair how if you want to do a formal motion about making changes or if Philip feels like he, he and Rippin know, you know, if they listen to the conversation, they know what everyone said. Um, it didn't sound like there was too much question about what the topics are and what goes where. Yeah. I think between Philip and myself and we work together on taking the input here and working out, the agenda plan, and then we'll have an opportunity as a committee to review the revised plan. And if we didn't get it right, then you'll set us right. Yeah. And, you know, just 
thinking about it a little bit more, it's not like if you make a motion to change this, you can even stick to it, right? I mean, there are things that will be out of your control. There are things that you might want to change anyway. So I think it's enough that, you know, Philip and Ribbon have heard what the committee has had to say. There's yep. the video. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank so you. this is a working work plan that will have right. changes. As, right. and as all of our committees really are. You know, yep. and also, as you mentioned, there's a lot of dependencies uh, between these different items. So a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I was um, going to hint for staff um, in XCAP's report. There's actually a section on suggestions for the um, updates to the criteria. So part of what we referenced in our report was the fact that we had conflicting criteria um, because we had the 2013 Palo Alto rail report, which basically talks about trying to make more east west crossings. And then we had other documents that pointed to other things. So you might want to look there when you guys are thinking about your staff report to kind of raise how we do have several policy documents that seem to contradict each other um, when we're thinking about these priorities. So we make sure we kind of catch everything. And I'm thinking specifically of the, the comp plan has things that are not necessarily the same as what was in the criteria and not necessarily the same as what's in that Palo Alto rail report for, I think it's 2012 or. I forget what 2013 maybe it's in the XCAP report. And I'm just uh, out as looking forward to both kind of our most immediate, the March and April meetings and a focus on the March. So we've got on March, the selection criteria um, and then the, um, the Caltrain um, construction methods. Uh, is it, was that it? Yeah, and then just to mention something else that we would be, we would be doing in tandem. Well, a lot of these things will be doing in tandem, but one of the other things that we heard is we'll hold on doing the uh, cost um, uh, peer review on the trench alternative, uh, pending referring to council for an affirmation of that. So it's it's a temporary hold until we can get back to council. Yep. Um, and I guess as I'm uh, trying to think about uh, what else in March. Yeah, uh, city manager. Actually, you, you raise an important point as to uh, whether and how to keep the full council aware of this conversation. There might be something you could even report out verbally, verbally at the next council meeting, if not more formally. Yeah, I'm trying to think about how we might summarize this <laughs> freewheeling conversation. But it does connect it with that. Uh, and maybe we, whether it's the March meeting or April, Philip and I can kind of brainstorm on this is do we identify which are the most immediate things we need to take back to the council for affirmation in order to make sure that we have their authority to proceed in the way that we think is our revised plan. And so maybe we want to have that discussion in March, whether we resolve it or not, put it on the agenda for prospective referrals to council. Um, and so that we'll have We'll be able to digest this discussion and and be thinking about um, outside the meeting what things uh, we need to ask their uh, uh, consent on. All good. Um, I think that rings the bell twenty minutes early, despite feeling like a very long meeting, at least a full meeting. Um, so unless anybody has anything else, uh, our meeting is adjourned. Oh, I, I should refine what's, just so everybody knows, the date of our next meeting is scheduled for March 15th. Sounds great. Same time, same place. All right. Thank you.